welcome everyone to our final Victor session in 2020. And uh, I can hear the cheers already uh, rising from the crowd uh, for 2020, that is. <laughs> and of course, uh, for today's talk. Um, but I just have a few announcements just to uh, start us off and uh, let others uh, sh uh, enter the room here. I uh, just wanted to say a few things about Victor. We're the Virtual International Consortium for Truth to Search. It's an online community of scholars with an interest in the value and the nature of truth. Broadly construed, of course. We welcome anyone with an interest in these issues. And our mission is fourfold. We give researchers a platform for sharing work with a virtual community of uh, colleagues, independent of geographical location and institutional affiliation, to foster an environment of critical and constructive feedback, promote gender, racial, and ethnic inclusivity among those doing work on truth and support research in all areas of the philosophy of truth, including but not limited to work on the nature of truth, the value of truth, alethic virtues, and vices, verisimilitude and accuracy, and the importance of truth to issues in social, political, and moral philosophy. We also wanna take an opportunity now to acknowledge our sponsors, who have been generously supporting us either financially or, um, I should say, um, pastorally, uh, uh, including the Future of Truth Project at the University of Connecticut Humanities Institute, the University of Waikato, and the University of Alabama. We'd also like to take an opportunity, and I hope, Drew, you could post a, a message in our uh, chat uh, as well, to advertise that we have a mailing list for those interested, uh, a website, a uh, Facebook group, Twitter feed, YouTube channel, and just about everything else uh, uh, we can take as a means to communicate with all of our interested uh, parties. So today it's uh, my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce our speaker, Sharif Ghulam Salem from Simon Fraser University, who will be speaking on modal truth. With that, I will hand it over to Sharif and take it away. Thank you so much for inviting me. So I'm planning to talk for about like 30 minutes because I want to spend most of the time like in discussion better than just uh, talking. Uh, so this is a talk. Uh, so this is highly, uh, it's a kind of warning that this is highly like in progress. So I'm still thinking about uh, a lot of these ideas. <clears throat> so I'm re not really committed to anything at this moment. So I'm just, so I thought like of taking advantage of this amazing group to maybe share some of these ideas at early stages and uh, seeing what people think about this. So this is a talk on, on model epistemology, basically. So here I'll be talking about how do uh, we get to get the knowledge of necessities. So I wasn't sure about the general background of people. So uh, because I expect some people might not be very familiar with this stuff. So I'll just have a very brief introduction to modal essentialism. And then uh, some of Kate Fine's like treatises and then how this uh, somehow factor out in what people call the explanation challenge. And then I'll be investigating like one model uh, or one, one, one attempt to explain or to uh, answer the explanation challenge, which is Maluzzi's uh, essence as super explanatory thesis. Then, uh, so actually, if you look at this, this is more like a meta metaphysics talk. But because of the nature of Maluzzi's uh, proposal to answer the explanation challenge, uh, the, the talk will kind of shift to more of a philosophy of science talk, because now actually I'll be giving a kind of three uh, epistemological objections to super explanatory essentially. The first one relies on the kind of ambiguity of the notion of essence in science. The second one is uh, also a kind of uh, criticism of the accidental uh, essential distinction of properties. I'm not sure about uh, whether one implies two or two implies one, so I kept them separate at this stage, but they're correlated, but I'm not sure about the relation yet. And then the third uh, objection is kind of a general objection, which is coming from a pessimistic meta-induction. I'll be standing, spending most of the talk, actually I'll say like maybe half of the talk on the third uh, criticism, which is from PMI. And then I'll be presenting like a, a kind of a potential response to PMI, like how Maluzzi and other proponents 
uh, of super explanatory essentials might respond to PMR. And then I'll present, I'll be finally presenting my response to uh, their criticism. Then I'll be concluding. So first, like a very general introduction. So model essentialism, you can think of it as the movement which can be traced back to Kripke and Putnam's influential work, which connected like essential thinking to concepts of modality and possible world. So there is a uh, far like presents like one variant of modal essentialism, which is the thesis that essentialism can be defined in terms of necessity, which is the existence based condition that a property F is an essential property of an object X, if and only if it is necessary that if X exists, then X has property F. So the basic idea is that we can somehow ground uh, <clears throat> essentialism in terms of necessity. So you can explain essentialism in terms of necessity. And then I find like famously, uh, somehow presented like some kind of arguments against this thesis, uh, specifically like four arguments, which I'm not going uh, through because they're well known. But his basic idea is that somehow modal essentialism fails in producing a notion of necessity that is extensionally equivalent to the notion of ethics. So they're not the same basically. So you cannot ground uh, essences in necessity or in modal notion. So instead he reverses the picture and he proposes to reverse like modal essentialism. So instead of essences as a special case of metaphysical necessity, we should view metaphysical necessity as a special case of essences. So one can define it as following every metaphysical necessary truth is true, is true in virtue of the nature of one or more essential truths. Here essential truths are uh, take the following form. It is essential to X that far. So in this way, somehow Farn thinks that the notion of essence enjoys some kind of conceptual priority such that there are some kind of theoretically primitive. So we cannot really reason about essences themselves because somehow they're conceptual prior to um, other notions like modality. So we, we have to take them as kind of primitive. But some people started to complain about this which became to be known as the explanation challenge. So for which, for instance, this non-reductive interpretation of essence or of essentialism suffers from an explanation challenge that we, he, he thinks that we must accommodate explanations of necessary of necessity truths. This should be, uh, I think, necessary. Or through sources and avoid unexplained necessity truths. So in this spirit, it means that somehow we'll not be able to make any kind of progress regarding uh, the essentialist project, Fine's project basically, uh, uh, modal primitives, until we have some kind of grasp of what we mean by like essences. So this is basically the explanation challenge that how can we explain the notion of essences? And most of the literature is usually discussing the relationship between like essence and modality, but uh, very few literature is discussing the nature of essences themselves. So one uh, new uh, way of answering the explanation challenge, it's kind of recent, was presented by uh, Maluzzi with two papers. So here, this is, uh, now I'll be moving to this part in the presentation, which is on modal truths, uh, essences as super explanatory. So, her proposal is basically that uh, <clears throat> somehow essences should be viewed as uh, a current, uh, as consistent with our current scientific zeitgeist. So somehow that essences are things that can be empirically discovered. And I think one of the motives for this is that she wants to avoid any kind of pure metaphysical talk about essences. Uh, that people might find a kind of medieval or somehow pre the scientific age or something like this. So she thought like <clears throat> one one way to make thing, uh, to make progress is just by focusing on uh, essences which can be somehow revealed through our scientific knowledge. So this is her schema, which is called like this. She calls the essentials deduction that metaphysical necessity depends on facts about essence. 
And then knowledge of modality proceeds like inferentially from premises concerning uh, what, what is to conclusion about metaphysical necessity. And how to reveal the premises about what is, is through scientific investigation. And he, she takes uh, this kind of explanation to be super explanation or super explanatory in the sense that essences are not only, do not only ground uh, necessity in this way, but somehow they, sup they, they are super explanatory. They says they super explain, they explain in, in, a, in, a, in a much general way than just a basic uh, grounding way or causal way. So, one can summarize uh, that her approach to somehow cover specific areas. So Maluzi's super explanatory essentialism works well in handling different cases of metaphysical modality, like um, essentiality of origins, the constitution of particulars, necessity of identity, and natural terms. So one question is whether uh, her essentialism like, can cover all kinds of necessities or modalities, or stuff like that, this is a different question. But for now, uh, the list is maybe limited to these uh, categories. So she talks a lot about natural kinds. So that's why I'd be spending most of the time talking about natural kinds as a kind of paradigm case. So many agree that the way to explain how the members of a natural kind share the different sets of properties like mechanisms, etc that produces their similar attributes, attributes is kind of causal explanation. So these essential properties are considered to be intrinsic or context independent and stable properties for all natural kinds. And this is what uh, Ruth Millikan refers to as eternal point. So for Maluzi, if you take the case of silver, for instance, being with atomic number 47 is considered under her view to be the essence of silver. And somehow this grounds the uh, necessity of some of the basic properties of silver because somehow of its unique subatomic configuration that caused silver to have the unique physical properties shared by all of its instances. So to sum up her, her view, Somehow, super explanatory essentialism has two main theses. The first one is that essences causally explain all the instantiations of a natural kind and other categories. But since we are not talk we are talking only about natural kinds now, so that's what I'm referring to here. And two, essences constitutively determine the nature of metaphysical necessities of all the instantiations of this kind. So you move from one to two by inference. So this is what we'll call. Uh, as we're referring to as kind of bridge principle where you can move from one to two. So now what I'll be doing is I want to uh, think uh, whether this kind of understanding of essence uh, is cogent or there are some kind of objection to this kind of uh, modal truth theory about the nature of essences. So somehow my goal is to show that modal truth cannot be established by super explanatory essentialism. And this is for three reasons. The first one, essences are not well defined, specifically in science. The second one is the distinction between essence and accidents or essential and accidental properties is kind of ambiguous. The third one that there is a good, good inductive reason to believe that our best scientific theories might turn out to be false. So I'll be spending a little time on the first objection and most of the time or the rest of the time on the last uh, objection. So let's see the first one. So if you look at Putnam's paradigm case, like water is essentially H2O. For sure, this is a kind of toy example, but let's assume you can reduce water to a single essence, which is H2O. Then, or like silver to uh, atomic number, 47 or anything like this, as uh, Maluzi suggested. Then if you look at the, in the literature of philosophy of chemistry, for instance, then you find like a typical molecule of H2O has nothing to do with observable properties that we conventionally associate with water. 
So even like if you considerably simplify things, you find like the pure water, for instance, a kind of combination of H2O, hydronium, hydroxide, but other common ions. So here we have this, uh, like came from Van Breken, that the problem is that we are not, uh, not that we are unsure which distribution of types of the microstructure is the correct one. The point is that the point is that there is no one correct microstructure, because somehow the microstructure depends as much on the context and functions just as another nominal essence would. So here he's saying that somehow we cannot really talk about real essences of water, but we can talk about some some kind of nominal essence about like different microstructures which uh, might give rise to the phenomenological properties of water that we commonly observe but we cannot really talk about a real essence of water so the best way like uh, at least to the best of my knowledge to understand like what the essence of water is or the real essence of water is through some kind of statistical average that describe ele electron transfer, which give water rise to its uh, observable qualities. So if only science can establish what the metaphysically necessarily properties of water are, we know for sure that being H2O is not one of these properties. So this argument can be generalized. So this is a kind of just uh, a specific case, like in the case of water and H2O, but if you look into other cases, and we'll be seeing another case uh, in a few moments, in physics and biology and other like hard sciences, you'll find like a lot of these problems. We, we cannot pinpoint the essence uh, of basic uh, scientific terms or basic theoretical terms. So someone might think, okay, so maybe essence can be defined as a statistical kind of statistical averages or something like this. Uh, that's an interesting possibility, but also when I look into this, I found that you run into other problems like the reference class problem, uh, which might give rise to different uh, categories of essences, which are somehow might be even uh, contradictory to some sense. So also resorting to, instead of shifting the essence from uh, like single objects to uh, statistical average, you still run into problems like the reference class problem. The second um, epistemological objection is, which is very related to the first one, is that the essential accidental distinction of properties is not clear. So here I want to problematize this. So if you take the uh, case of a kind of paradigmatic fundamental particle, like the atom. So when people talk about elements, they refer to the atomic number and atomic weight as uh, basic determinants of the elements. So atomic number is determined by the number of protons and atomic weight is determined by the number of neutrons. And these are considered to be essential properties that make different elements what they are. However, uh, if you look uh, into again, uh, like philosophy of chemistry and literature, you find some weird cases or some kind, I'm not saying not outlier cases, but some cases which shows that this kind of distinction is not very clear to us. So for instance, like the uranium, it has a stable atomic number across all of its institutions, but has no stable isotope. In the sense that there are two types of uranium, like 235 and 238. Both of them have different atomic weights, but they have the same atomic number. And actually by virtue of having different atomic uh, weights, they somehow exhibit some kind of different properties. So here we have a case somehow uh, that uh, the atomic weight, although in most of the cases it behaves as, uh, as a kind of essential property, in this case it behaves as, it, as if it is a kind of accidental property, despite being widely acknowledged as a kind of fundamental property. So this is kind of counter example. And again, there are a lot of other examples, but I just want to save time uh, about somehow uh, the ambiguity of the essential and accidental distinction. Again, whether this 
objection is related to the first one about that SSS cannot be defined. This is maybe a question we can discuss uh, later. My final uh, argument is uh, from pessimistic meta-induction. So super-explanatory essentialism relies on a form of scientific realism, where somehow mature scientific theories are approximately true, in the sense that they're theoretical terms thereafter. So this is a built-in assumption in super-explanatory essentialism, that we'll be able at some point in time to discover the essences of objects uh, by <coughs> scientific progress or something like this, that our scientific theories are getting mature by time. But the PMI goes as follows. This is a classic uh, argument in philosophy of science for sure, since Larry Loudon, uh, that most of the successful path theories that were considered to be approximately true later turned on to be approximately false and thus got rejected. So consequently, most of the current successful theories are probably false too and are going to be rejected at some point in the future. So, one, one, one way Maluzzi and other proponents of super explanatory essentialism can argue against PMR is by relying on some kind of, as we said, a scientific progress uh, thesis. She hints uh, on something like this in her paper, although she does not flesh out the whole argument, so I'm fleshing out the argument on her behalf, but this is what she says. Although in the case of chemical elements, we can individuate their essence with a good approximation, at the level of subatomic particles. For sure, I objected already to this kind of statement in the first two uh, objections. It is of course sometimes not easy to pin down exactly which properties or mechanisms do the relevant causal work. This should not be taken to undermine the essential picture. Oftentimes, we just do not know yet what the essence is. Science progressively discloses the causal structure of the world. So even if we don't know now, what essence is, at some point in time, because science progresses, we'll be able to discover the causal structure of the world, and hence we'll be have uh, an understanding of the modal truths of these uh, objects. So this is uh, relies on an argument from scientific progress against PMR. So what's the argument? The core idea, this is one version of the argument. There are other versions, uh, which I'll entertain later maybe, or in the discussion we can discuss them. But this is the general spirit. The core idea is that there is a kind of substantial difference between scientific theories developed before and after the 20th century. They notice that PMI's counterexamples, like stuff in the uh, Larry Loudon's list, are examples of theories that have been developed before the 20th century and hence cannot be used as a paradigm cases for judging the state of future theory. So the basic idea is that if you look in the history of science, you find a kind of demarcation point like between theories between uh, before the 20th century, roughly, and after the 20th century. And they're saying that all of the counter examples that PMI relied on uh, are using uh, theories prior to the 20th century. So somehow they cannot be uh, inductively used against future theories. So Farbach, for instance, claims that 80% of the totality of science that has been produced in the 50s, 80% uh, of the totality of science has been produced since the 50s, which implies that only 20% were produced before that. And that is, there were no practically theory changes among our best scientific theories. So our scientific theories now, or contemporary scientific theories at best, are kind of stable. So we don't expect anything to fundamentally change soon. And he produces this interest statistics by investigating uh, like the history of science and uh, comparing the data and stuff like that. But this is uh, maybe a contested statistics, but I'm not discussing now. But even if you grant that this statistic is true, I will also argue against it later on. So one can um, summarize their argument in terms of uh, what they call like optimistic meta-induction. But first, let's see what are the success indicators of scientific uh, theories that people are relying on 
or the OMI or the optimistic meta indexes. So they rely on the quantity, quantity of scientific work, the range, the quantity and accuracy of data and observations, and the computational power of our best scientific theories. So if we apply these five criteria to our current scientific theories, they by far outweigh like all of the past scientific theories. And that's why we have very good reason to believe that our scientific theories, our current scientific theories, enjoy a kind of epistemic privilege over the post theories, which enjoy the kind of mediocre success according to these five criteria. So the optimistic meta induction is saying that given that our, our best scientific theories are kind of epistemic, epistemically privileged, then they will not be likely falsified in the future. So to sum up the argument from scientific progress is twofold. One is rejecting the inference of PMI by denying the analogous relation between our contemporary theories and post ones. The second one is kind of offering an optimistic counterpart to PMI. Okay, so this is one version of uh, how uh, Maluzi might uh, push her argument uh, against PMI, there are other versions, but I believe my response to uh, the optimistic meta induction argument will somehow cover also the other versions which we might discuss later. So here are my uh, four responses to the scientific progress objection. The first one is that their argument seems to miss the crux of PMI which is basically questioning the explanatory connection between the experimental success of a theory and its truth value. So here, the point is not that we discussing like whether the current theories are epistemically privileged or not. The idea is that it is possible to have, it's conceivable and just like empirically, uh, like historically happened that there is a kind of disconnection between like the experimental success of a theory, the empirical validation of a theory and its truth value. And this is what all PMI support needs to have to establish few cases of theories that were successful, but false. And somehow the argument cannot be undermined by appealing to any hypothetical division between old and contemporary theories. The second uh, response or the second argument is that Park's desiderata that distinguish between old and contemporary theories are kind of very general and can almost be applied to any new theory vis-a-vis -vis any older theory at any point in time. I'm talking about this um, five desiderata which they use to argue for the epistemic privilege of our current theories. I think these criteria are very general. It can be just applied to any newer theory versus any older theory in, in time. So if you compare like al Hazm theory of optics, which was produced like in medieval Islamic times versus like Ptolemy theory of optics, for sure you'll find that <clears throat> this newer theory satisfies like the five desiderata of Pork. But by no reason, this means that al hazm theory of optics is now like epistemically, epistemically privileged because we know it's false by this time, right? So maybe at the time it was epistemically privileged, yes, over Ptolemy's theory of optics, but now it's not. And this is exactly the idea of the pessimistic meta-induction order. So also a third objection is that the epistemic progress uh, thesis, the scientific progress uh, thesis operates on the pretext of what I call like epistemic presentation, which is the overestimation of the state of present scientific knowledge for no reason other than being contemporary. So, and this again can apply at any, for any generation of scientists. So they, 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 there is a kind of te uh, tendency to overestimate the uh, present state of scientific knowledge. And there was this uh, famous incident uh, by Lord Kelvin, like in the late 19th century, when he announced um, in one of the scientific meetings that somehow like uh, physics is almost, uh, has almost ended there is nothing uh, major to discover in physics. We just have to make like fewer 
uh, more predictions or more accurate predictions or more accurate statements, but there is nothing fundamentally going to change. So we found this across like all many generations of scientists that, that there is a kind of overestimation of their scientific knowledge. So if the, if the OMI is correct, then it could have been used by any generation of scientists across history to justify, justify their contemporary theory. My final uh, objection is that the scientific progress thesis has a kind of pathological character. So after all, it is not a priori possible to falsify the scientific progress thesis since any given counter example can be ruled out on the ground that it does not represent our best contemporary theory. So if I give you any counter example, you can just uh, dismiss it by saying, but this does not represent like our epistemically privileged scientific theories and, some, and therefore it cannot be used as a counter example. So it's kind of question begging. It always keeps excluding any counter example. So to sum up, my talk, I argued that modal truth cannot be established by super extrapolation essentialism for, uh, for the three objections uh, I mentioned. However, uh, these objections are merely epistemic and hence cannot be used to undermine the metaphysical essentialist project in, of modality in, gen in general. But they can be used to challenge any project that relies on a scientific notion of essence. If this is true, if my objections are correct, this means that we still do not have any satisfactory answer to the explanation challenge for finds primitive essentialism. That we still, that the, the proposal that uh, its essences can be explained uh, by uh, scientific investigation or any other kind of method is still open. So we still have this kind of primitive uh, essentialism uh, unanswered. Thank you. And these are my references.